Good morning, this is Monty once again from uh, DPL Surveillance Equipment. Um, looks like it's going to be a very nice day today here in southern, sunny Southern California, uh, in Camarillo, California, uh, more specifically. Uh, just finished wiping down my car. <laughs> Figure I better get that out of the way. <clears throat> that way I can concentrate uh, better uh, when I'm doing the podcast. And um, let's see. So what's going on today? I, I was reviewing a few things, of course, as I usually do in terms of what's going on with the economy, what's going on in the financial markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Hmm. Uh, uh, let's see, what is on the, at the top of the list? The, the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the forest fires and the earthquakes. It looks like um, a number of economists are trying to measure um, the impact on the economy. When you have natural disasters, uh, particularly in the United States, and, of course, a number of those occur outside the United States. A lot of economists, they really want to know how does this affect uh, world and national uh, economic growth. In other words, um, when you are, uh, <clears throat> when you have to pay to clean up uh, the devastation caused by floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and and, and earthquakes and such, a lot of people really want to know, the economists want to know, rather, uh, how does this Im- it, uh, impact um, GDP, for instance. And a lot of economists have come to the conclusion, uh, I've got to look more into it, but so far it looks like the consensus is it doesn't really have a significant impact on, uh, excuse this noise for a second, On GDP, in other words, uh, what you really want to know is whether or not um, the economy could be growing uh, faster or, or whether or not the economy is actually, you know, experiencing a setback. One second. Overall, when it, when it comes to uh, paying for the cost of cleanup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so far, the consensus, again, seems to indicate that, um, you know, the, the economy rebounds uh, uh, significantly well. But you've got to read between the lines because just because some idiot economist tells you that, you know what, forget about all the cars that were damaged because of flooding in Houston. Uh, because people are going to have to go out and buy new cars, right, uh, to replace the, uh, the ones that got damaged. Well, that's one way of saying that this is stimulating the economy. But you may ask yourself, is that, is that really the proper way to stimulate the economy? In other words, if, if you didn't have to go out and, 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 and um, buy a new car or replace the one that, that, was, just, that, that was working just fine, um, if, you know, if insurance companies didn't have to bail out all of these homeowners to buy to buy new houses or, or, or uh, because not, not everybody gets a new house, right? Some people decide, you know, well, this is enough is enough. I need to get out of this flood plain or get out of this earthquake prone area or get out of this tornado alley and locate somewhere else. So a lot of the temporary stimulus that I think the economists and certain people are, point, uh, certain people are pointing to really doesn't paint the whole entire picture in terms of uh, all the moving parts that typically go on. So, anyway, that was my two bit, my two cents on on that particular um, scenario in terms of whether or not um, natural disasters are doing more harm than good. Uh, my name is Monty Henry, by the way, you guys. I run a, sur- a full service surveillance and security equipment company. We have lifetime guarantees and warranties on all the products. We have twenty four seven, three sixty five tech sales and customer support. We have the largest inventory of items that not only can you buy, but you can rent or lay away as well. And we have a growing um, amount of information, educational information, in the way of podcasts, blogs, demonstration videos. Um, what else? 
demonstration videos, articles, podcasts, and blogs. Uh, all of them are free. Share them with other people. Download them. Do whatever you want to do. Distribute them out uh, for, you know, uh, discussions and, and debates or whatever you want to use. I don't care. Um, we try to raise, raise the educational level uh, of, of, of society or anybody who wants to increase their knowledge in such certain areas. Uh, we, we, for instance, we, we, we have articles and blogs and podcasts about health and fitness, uh, economics and finance, cybersecurity, surveillance and counter-surveillance, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as well. Um, also, we do accept Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in our shopping cart. It's been upgraded and uh, works very well. So you crypto millionaires, take some of your millions and go and buy your favorite spy gadgets from us. They're all lifetime guaranteed and warranty products. They're state of the art. And um, use your crypto money. Some of that, we know, we know some of you got in early and, and you're doing quite well because I, I know the feeling because we got in early as well. So we, we, know, how, we know what kind of situation you're in, <laughs> definitely. And um, what else? The website has been completely redesigned. And it works well, looks good, and um, we're putting some final tweaks on just a few things uh, on the website. Um, let's see, I can't remember what exactly it was. Not, nothing very important. Most of the important things are done. We're going to integrate tracking capabilities so you can track your shipments and get notifications and all of that stuff. So that's a minor tweak, basically. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're trying to phase out the use of MasterCard and Visa American Express, as I say every single time, and I'll say it a million times more, we need to wean ourselves off of the rewards points or blood money that's given out to us by MasterCard and Visa and American Express and Discover. Those guys are blood suckers. They're rent seekers. And the cryptocurrency industry is going to re completely replace the, 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 the banks and the financial institutions and the credit card companies and the merchant processors and the intermediaries. So just make sure you guys understand that's a dinosaur dying industry. They're sapping $70 billion alone from merchants and retailers in the ways of discount fees and settlement fees and batch fees and service fees and every miscellaneous type of fee that they can label and stick on a piece of paper. Um, in addition to that, they're draining $700 billion a year from the remittances industry. That's the industry where you send money to your loved ones um, from Mexico to the United States or vice versa or from one country in Africa to another country or from Philippines to the United States or vice versa. They, they take $700 billion at least out of each and every one of our pockets for things such as sending digits and bits and bytes across the internet and from computer to computer and it doesn't make any sense, okay? so. Uh, make sure you understand that use cryptocurrencies, use Bitcoin and blockchain, Ethereum, like and all these technologies to get that money back and forth and to circumvent and expedite the downfall of the um, traditional finance industry. Now, also, we have an article, believe it or not. This article is part of our regular series. Uh, it's called The Economy Stupid. And as part of The Economy Stupid, and we're on episode um, 24 uh, amazingly, we we have all the we, we're all the way up to 24, and it's the economy stupid. Now the economy stupid is named that way because President Clinton, as far as I can tell, he was warning uh, consumers and taxpayers and businesses and certain and, and, and everyone that, that would listen that there are certain things that are within your control and certain things that are beyond your control. When it has to do with the economy, don't beat your head against the wall. Just realize there's a large macro. Um, uh, dynamic out there and you can't control it as much as, as, we, as you would like to so you, you just understand that um, things are happening on a macro level and you, and you have to plan and prepare and, and, and not so much um, uh, react to these things uh, as, you know, in a way that a lot of people would ordinarily react to things that they, things that they could control so on a micro level, you can control a lot of things, but on a macro level, the larger big, big economy, you can't. So <clears throat> let's dip into the, today's uh, episode 24. Federal Reserve considers a new tool to avert crisis. Some officials favor demanding banks stock up on capital while the economy is strong. A, day, 
a decade after a financial crisis that paralyzed the global economy, uh, Federal Reserve officials are debating how to apply one of the essential lessons they drew from that dark episode. It, invol it, it, it in involves preventing the next crisis from happening on their watch. Um, the Fed has two tools for stamping out financial bubbles. It could use either regulation or interest rate increases to prevent banks and other financial institutions from getting carried away during an economic boom. Many Fed officials concluded after the last crisis that it's best to use regulation. They can apply that tool surgically while aggressive interest rates, while aggressive interest rate increases like taking a sledgehammer to a nail might damage the broader economy in the name of financial stability. Some Fed officials want to use one of the regulatory tools the central bank developed after the crisis called a counter-cyclical capital buffer. It can require the U.S.'s largest banks to sock away additional capital during good times so they have more to fall back on when loans go bad during, a time, uh, during bad times, like socking away oil and the nation's strategic oil reserve. Um, now, I just want to add that the um, the strategic oil reserve it basically uh, is what the United States uses, so that when things uh, turn down in the economy, uh, or when oil specifically. Uh, gets cut off, such as it did in, 1970, in the 1970s, you know, the o o OPEC cut back on oil production. Uh, I'm sorry, they, they t it typically um, um, cut the amount of oil coming to the United States, so we had to dip into the, the petroleum reserves. Um, but that's not the point, <laughs> actually, that I wanted to make. The point I wanted to make is this counter-cyclical -cyclic capital buffer. Basically... That's a fancy way of saying that the Federal Reserve wants the banks to um, hold more capital. In other words, as you go into a recession and if banks don't have enough capital, just like a household budget, if you don't have enough savings and investment, you're going to be hurting, right? So the Federal Reserve is saying, look, banks, we're going to go into a recession and uh, we want you to have more capital on hand because you know that your depositors are going to rush to the bank. When, when times get hard, uh, depositors, they go to the bank and they withdraw more and more money out of the bank to pay for the bills and to pay the house note and the rent and the car loans, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to see a massive drain on your capital. So I want you to be prepared and put more capital aside. That's, that's what they're saying when they mention this long, drawn-out term counter counter cyclical capital buffer okay um, moving right along but but other officials as well as the banking industry have questioned why the tool is needed now when bank capital levels are high and financial stability risks appear in check and this is also pretty stupid because um, you do these things when times are good right you you, you save more money you invest more money when, when times are good, as they say, make hay while the sun shines. Look, look it up. That's a saying. Uh, make hay while the sun shines. That implies that when times are good, you, 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 you do the things that you need to do while they last. In other words, if you're working overtime at the job, or, you, or if you get the opportunity to work overtime at the job, you work as many hours as you can while it's being offered. If you're a farmer, you... you, 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 you <laughs> Create. Um, you you uh, do as much farming and you do much as much planting as you can while the sun is out and and, and everything is conducive to to getting large crops. You do all of that work now as compared to when winter comes. Right, you're not going to be able to do as much. So you make hay while the sun shines. It's an old saying. One reason for the concern is that asset prices are booming. U.S. household net worth, a function of rising stock and real estate values was nearly seven times household after tax incomes in the first quarter, according to the Fed. That's higher than, um, that's higher than during the tech boom of the late 1990s or real estate boom of the 2000s, both of which ended badly. Now, this is a blatant lie, actually. This part about um, 
household wealth mainly because um, when the, when they when these uh, media companies, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, whoever, when they write these articles about household wealth um, increasing and looking very healthy and all that, they're referring to one or two percent of the entire population. In other words, when they look at the amount of stocks, real estate, bonds, gold, whatever, these things are making up uh, the household wealth of the people they're surveying. That usually means that um, if you have stocks and real estate and bonds and gold and all these other assets increasing in value, you're amongst the 1% or 2%. That's not the general population. So, again, when they talk about household wealth um, being high and picking up and all that, they, they're referring to a, a group of people that is not typical of the larger population. Just want to make that distinction. So read between the lines and don't believe the hype. One reason for their concern is that asset prices are booming. Uh, let me see. Okay, we read that. Um, capital is long-term money a bank draws on to make loans, coming largely from shareholders and retained profit, profits. Uh, it represents funds the bank isn't on the hook to pay back right away, like a bank deposit. When a loan portfolio is go, when a loan portfolio goes sour, that creates an important cushion in a, sh in a shock when depositors and others demand their money back quickly from their banks. Again, when you have a recession, um, depositors are going to get that money out of the bank and, 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 and they're going to try to you know, pay bills and buy groceries and put gas in the car because that's what they do Okay, during a recession. So um, forcing banks to hold additional capital might take some pressure off the Fed to raise rates, raise interest rates very aggressively to cool the economy if it overheats. Some officials also like the tool because the buffer can be reduced when an actual downturn hits, providing relief to banks when they really need it. So again, all this is in preparation um, for an, an eventual bad outcome, such as a recession, as compared to um, waiting to the last minute. Officials in other places like the UK, Ireland, France, and Hong Kong have raised their capital buffers while the Fed is set at zero. So other countries look like are taking the, um, are being proactive and they're making preparations and they're far away, far ahead of us as compared to waiting and pleading with the, the banks who obviously um, are lazy and, and stupid and, and, and want to procrastinate and, and, and instead they're going to screw up the economy like they did before, and then they're going to ask for a bailout. So that's, that's what happens. This would be a good time to be raising their capital, uh, raising that capital buffer, said Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester in a July interview. In good times, you raise it. Not using it now puts you in you, in, you puts you more into the camp of using interest rates to guard against financial instability. She added. It was a subject of discussion at a Boston Fed conference Friday and Saturday. Ms. Mester is among five regional Fed bank presidents pushing for a move, but the authority isn't in their hands. Instead, Fed governors in Washington, overseen by Board uh, Chair uh, Chairman Jerome Powell, make the decision, voting at least once a year on its, on its level. Uh, one Fed governor, uh, Leo, Leo Brainerd, has publicly backed increasing the buffer. Mr. Powell hasn't weighed in publicly except to say in June he didn't think uh, financial st uh, stability risks were mean meanfully above normal. Now, again, Powell is not being realistic in terms of understanding that you have to be proactive. You don't wait until the enemy is right there in front of you. <laughs> you typically want to take some um, precaution and, do, and be prepared ahead of time versus waiting. Moving right along, banks and some Fed officials argue against the move. One reason is that big banks have already built up substantial levels of capital among banks with assets greater than $50 billion, so-called Tier 1 capital, was 12.7% of assets in the first quarter compared with 8.5% in 2008. Another, another limitation of the rule is that it only applies to big banks, those with assets of at least of less than $50 billion have, th have seen their capital shrink to 14.2% of assets in the first quarter from 15.7% in 2012. 
Now, I actually have to add, um, just so you guys can know, capital um, requirements and, and, and banks um, adhering to the stress test, the benchmarks uh, have been lowered because a number of banks have been failing. Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, a few of these banks have been getting Fs when it comes to the stress test as far as, putting, uh, as, far as the capital requirements are concerned. And the federal government has actually gone in and said, you know what, you guys, we, we feel sorry for you. We're going to treat you like the millennials, or, or some might say, of today in terms of giving everyone a trophy or a sticker or a reward or something just for showing up or breathing or something. And, and this is applying to the banks as well. Instead of me being stringent and strict with them and making them or forcing them <clears throat> to adhere to these stress, uh, stress tests and capital requirements, they're lowering, lowering the benchmark so everyone can get a passing grade. Um, we've just gone through a lot of changes in terms of how financial institutions are going to be regulated. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic said in an interview last month, he said it made sense to see how banks manage the new rules before placing a new demand on them. Again, another attempt at appeasing the banks as compared to forcing them to do what they're supposed to do anyway. Under one possible compromise, the Fed might stop ramping up the difficulty of the stress test, as I mentioned before, you guys, while activating the new capital buffer. The stress tests are important to banks because they dictate how much they can pay in dividends and deploy it towards uh, share buybacks. So banks have indeed been um, putting more emphasis on dividend increases and share buybacks as compared to... Um, uh, putting money away for a rainy day. Uh, uh, this is what they do. If you if you let them, they they'll they'll put capital away. And um, I, I'm sorry. If you let them, they'll buy back their uh, company stock and and increase dividends. And uh, as compared to meeting the capital requirements, uh, the banking industry has bristled at the idea of deploying a regulatory tool simply because the economy is strong. Officials also say the Fed couldn't currently meet the criteria it laid out two years ago for activating the buffer. In 2016, the Fed said the buffer should be activated when systematic vulnerabilities are meaningfully above normal. Fed staff tasked with monitoring the financial system have characterized such vulnerabilities for now as moderate. Um, moving right along, this is further... Um, information on the uh, economy stupid episode 24 states face crunch if fed's toolkit is limited in next recession again states face crunch if fed's toolkit is limited in the next recession in other words we, the states want to know how, how the next recession is going to impact their, their their states and what they what they can do about it and you guys need to know how each state is going to fare depending upon whether or not it's technology-oriented, uh, commodity-oriented state, or service-oriented, or whatever, okay? Anyway, s simulation by the Boston Fed shows the central bank's inability to cut the rates by the usual five percentage points would disproportionately hit certain states. They're basically saying, going into a recession, or before you even get to a recession, you want to have higher interest rates so you can cut them. But if they're already low, like they are now, around 2% or so, then you can't cut very much. So again, when, you, when you're in a recession, you, you usually want to lower the rates um, from a higher point to a lower point. Just that stimulates the economy. But if you can't, you can't, right? So this is the, the dilemma. <laughs> For instance, Boston, when the next recession comes, some states are likely to suffer, um, <clears throat> suffer much more than others if the Federal Reserve lacks ammunition to make economic downturns less severe, new research shows. In recent downturns, the Fed has cut its short-term benchmark interest rate by about 5 percentage points to stimulate, the, stimulate growth. But in the future, that might be impossible because rates are still historically low. The Fed's benchmark rate is currently in a range between 1 and 3 quarters and 2 percent. Monetary buffers have been depleted, said Eric Rosengren, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston which sponsored the conference this weekend where the research was released. A decline in rates over the past decade means the Fed's, rate, uh, Fed's recent experience of running out of room to cut them after lowering them to zero would not be a one-time event, he said. 
Mr. Rosengren and his co-authors, Boston Fed Economist, Joe Peak and Jeffrey uh, Toto ran an experiment that shows how a recession might affect states assuming a traditional monetary policy response in which the Fed could cut its short-term benchmark rate by five percentage points. Then they looked at two other alternatives. In both, in both scenarios, monetary policy couldn't fully respond because the Fed had raised rates to only 2% before the hypothetical downturn. But in the last scenario, a regulatory, uh, in the last scenario, regulatory, state, and local, and federal fiscal buffers were also depleted because they weren't built up before the recession. So basically, they're just giving you an idea of um, <clears throat> how much room the government has and, 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 and how that's going to affect each state. Uh, moving right along, the results show, unsurprisingly, that the last scenario is the grimmest, but they also show that the effects are distributed, distributed unevenly across states. Some fare much worse than others when the Fed can't cut, cut, cut rates as it traditionally has. States with industries that are sensitive, sensitive to both economic cycle and interest rates, think of, uh, think of Michigan with its heavy dependence on the auto industry, could face, a, uh, could face a much worse downturn than Midwestern states that are heavy in agriculture, which is less exposed to a cyclical downturn. So this makes sense, you guys. Um, if your state is um, heavily invested in agriculture, and that's where most of your income comes from as a state, and you may not fare as badly or do as badly as a state like Michigan, whose economy is based upon automobile sales, right, and manufacture. So that does make sense. So when you're thinking about moving, when you think about relocating, try to figure out how is this state going to uh, behave in a recession, especially if you're going to be there very long, right? <laughs> if you're, you're in California or some states with a huge emphasis on agriculture and it's you know, pretty widely diversified anyway in California. It should not fare as badly as some other states that are dependent upon uh, <clears throat> some, some, you know, like something like exclusively automobiles, almost like, you know, like Michigan. Moving right, moving right along, state of policy. New research suggests changes in per capita personal income growth would hit some states much harder depending upon how aggressively monetary policy can respond to a recession. Take the first example in which monetary policy is able to respond as it traditionally does. Here, 16 states avoid declines in inflation-adjusted per capita income, including many southern states. In the second scenario, where monetary policy is limited, but the other policy buffers are available, all states experience declines in personal income. Midwestern states that depend on agriculture avoid some of the sharpest declines. Again, reiterating what we said earlier. The southern states that managed through the recession in the first simulation fare worse in the second example. In Alabama, for example, per capita income falls 1.9% versus nearly no change in the first simulation. In the final scenario, the southern states that didn't see any income loss in the first simulation are now among the states most severely adversely affect, uh, impacted when all policy buffers are insufficient. Uh, personal income falls even further by 2.7% in Alabama. Mr. Rosengren highlighted three areas where policy tools, if deployed now, could help compensate for the potential dearth of monetary stimulus. First, regulators could require banks to raise more capital in good times to prevent tighter lending from ex exacerbating an, an inevitable recession. Second, the federal government could implement fiscal policies that automatically boost safety net spending, such as unemployment insurance, during downturns. Downturns. Now, this is more likely because if um, <clears throat> the federal government procrastinates and the states don't consider, uh, you know, that they need to take precautions and be prepared, everybody is going to just wait for the government to print money and print checks. Okay, everybody's going to be looking for the federal government for a bailout if you don't prepare. So this is typically what happens. Moving right along. Third, state and local governments can build a rainy day funds to cushion downturns. Now, this would be ideal. Unlike the federal government, states generally can't run budget deficits, which typically leads to spending cuts and layoffs during a recession. A double whammy because private sector employment and investment is often shrinking. So this pretty much wraps up this article, you guys. Just want to let you know... Um, 
Again, this is The Economy Stupid, episode 24. Um, the federal government is running out of tools. States are hard-pressed to be prepared uh, between the federal government not having the ability to really force banks to set aside more money and a lot of states not understanding that they need to uh, also um, beef up their coffers because, uh, you know, if, 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 interest rates are, 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 if, if interest rates are higher, and um, that's going to make the recession more severe. And right now interest rates are really low, so you can't cut them from a high point to a low point if they're already 2%. <laughs> you can't go much, look, can't, you can't do a whole lot of stimulus that way. So that's going to be an issue, okay? So in other words, the, 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 the ways that we typically counter recessions is going to be um, limited going into the next recession, which some predict in about a couple of years. So just make sure you guys, read between the lines, and make sure you guys are prepared just in case. So as we like to say at the, at the conclusion of every podcast, um, keep your eyes and ears open and stay safe out there, okay? Anyway, we'll talk later.